Beard. Welcome to today's webinar. The petrochemical industry issues during and post COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you for taking time out and being here today. Okay, so if you have any question want to ask our speaker, kindly leave your question at the chat box. Okay, this is a sharing session regarding the issue facing by the petrochemical industry. So let's us welcome our speaker today, I.R. Chan Yu Kai, and our uh, moderator today, Dr. Tan. Okay, now we, um, without further ado, I will pass the session to Dr. Tan and I.R. Chan. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Miss Lee. All right. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you again for joining us today. Uh, we are very uh, honored because uh, I.R. Chan Yu Kai will join us today uh, to give uh, his sharing. Okay, so uh, without any further delay, I think we shall start the sharing session. So Ayachan, I'll share the screen. <clears throat> okay, Ayachan, over to you. Okay, uh, first of all, uh, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm very happy to be here with you all today. I must thank uh, Uta for uh, inviting me for this talk. And I think this, uh, this talk is very timely because the industry is actually at a crossroads. I would like just to share some of the knowledge I have on the petrochemical industry, uh, which um, I've uh, through working and also through meetings with all the multinationals, with government bodies, and also through uh, seminars. So some of the information which I pick up, the trends, the issues, I'd just like to share with you. So this is not a technical presentation. I must make it very clear but it's focusing on the issues facing the petrochemical industry. Um, right now, you're asking me, uh, Dr. Tan asked me to talk about right now during the pandemic, but I think it's not just now during the pandemic, but also medium and long term. What are the issues facing us in this uh, petrochemical industry? So next slide, please. So I think first, let's talk about this uh, pandemic. Right now, we are living in this pandemic. All these words you see on the screen, you're all very familiar. Words like lockdowns, working from homes, uh, new normal, SOPs, you all are very familiar with this. We are now living in a very different uh, lifestyle. The fact that now I'm speaking to you from my office, I don't need to go to Kampa to, uh, to be there. It is actually now a new style, new way of uh, living. So what is the impact currently? You can see, on the right side, you can see the impact. There's a boom in certain sectors. Delivery services, you're all eating at home. Take away, delivery to your home, food and all sorts of things. The second one which has boomed is the healthcare focused activities. So demand for medical gloves, face masks, they, I think you're all very familiar with that. It's really booming and uh, it has created, you look at the newspapers, a couple of a new billionaires in Malaysia because of this uh, boom in these healthcare focused activities. Right, now, the uh, gloves and masks are the end products. But what about the petrochemicals? Crude oil impact. You all know that there's been a 90% drop in air travel. And in terms of traveling by road, has also been very bad. So during the pandemic, more so April last year, it has led to what we call a destruction demand in crude oil. It was very, very bad. I will show you some of the numbers afterwards. But on the other hand, there has been an increased demand for certain petrochemicals because of the requirement for delivery services and healthcare focus activities. The third one which has been really impacting the industry right now, especially last year, is the supply chain disruptions. SOPs were introduced all over the world. So this really affected supply chain. Containers are stuck at the port. My personal experience is we have products stuck in China in the port for almost two months. Because of the SOPs, the staff were not allowed to come to work in the port initially. And after that, of course, they had to work uh, alternate shifts and all that. So it has really impacted on the supply chain. Okay, next one, please. Right. What are the issues in a bit more detail? Here, I would like to just uh, talk about oil demand because 
petrochemical industry, naphtha comes from oil. Oil demand is very important. This is the crux of our business in the petrochemical industry. Naphtha still contributes the bulk of the feedstocks. So it's very much crude oil related. So looking at this, I'd just like to quote from the International Energy Agency. This is the authority which monitors all the requirements, production of crude oil very, very closely. So you can see that it says the global oil demand is expected to recover by 5.5 million barrels a day to 96.6 million, million barrels per day in 2021. There was an unprecedented collapse of 8.8 .8 million barrels per day in 2020. So the resurgence in COVID-19 cases is slowing the rebound. Right. So this 8.8 .8 million barrels was an average for 2020. In April 2020, the demand came down by 20%. That was the lowest that we have actually, actually experienced. So what happened last year, uh, April 2020, branch prices came down to $24 per barrel. And uh, in USA, West Texas came down to negative on one day. First time in history because the company holding the oil had to deliver the oil to somewhere, it could not find storage. So actually it gave money away to people to take away the oil. So that's how bad it became last year. So that time uh, in our industry, we know of VLCCs, these very large uh, two carriers floating on the sea, full of oil. Pipelines are full, tanks almost tank top. That was the situation last year. Right, let's move on. Next slide, please. But what then happened for the packing industry? In our industry, I mentioned just now, the automotive industry, the construction industry, there was a steep decline. But as I mentioned, delivery services, healthcare sectors, boom. So what happens now is a very imbalance. Only certain petrochemicals, there was an increased demand. Example, propylene. Propylene goes into making adhesives for packaging. It goes into making packaging materials. You know, face masks. Face masks are this uh, number one uh, polypropylene. Then your nitro rubber gloves requires butadiene, acrylonitrile, and of course, you know, the sanitizers require isopropyl alcohol, ethanol. And your medical appliances, PPE, requires PVC. All the, uh, the bottles, uh, the, uh, the plastic bags and all that is PVC based. So the impact is there's a very irregular demand. And of course, what is the impact from this is the industry has faced serious price volatility, prices up and down. And how do you balance the production in the plant? Some products are required, some are not. So this has been a nightmare during the pandemic initial stage. Now it's trying to balance out. So there was a serious issue how to manage these operations. Next one, please. So this is a, maybe a bit small for you, but let me just uh, try to show this slide here. It shows what is the impact on the refinery and cracker operations during the pandemic, before, during, and right now. And this, we call it margins, refining margins. Refining margins is defined as your product minus crude oil. So you can see some of the products, jet fuel, gasoline, diesel, all came down. At one point, you can see it's negative margins. That means for every barrel of jet fuel they sell, they lose money. But demand for naphtha is very steady. You can see that. Naphtha is the one which goes into petrochemicals. So you must be asking why can't the refineries just shut down? They can't because they need to supply naphtha. And by producing naphtha, they still have to produce jet fuel, which they dump in the market sell it cheap. So that is what has happened during that time, during the COVID-19. So refining margins seriously affected. Next one. Okay, again, this is quite small. I just explained in terms of petrochemical spreads. Again, it's the same thing. The cost of the sales price of the ethylene propylene minus naphtha. So you can see that C2 and C3 show very good margins. Whereas for toluene, the margins suffered. 
So all in all, it's a very challenging time for the refineries and crackers. How to manage this sales versus operations? Okay, next one. I mentioned about price volatility. I just give you one example of one product, which is the ethylene vinyl acetate. You can see how the prices reach up to, this is a record now. This is the average before the COVID-19. And during COVID-19, initially, it crashed because people were uncertain what happened. Then when the requirements went up, it shut up. So it is required for adhesives, for packaging, and it reached a historical high. You can see the numbers there. Never before in history was this price. So this is reflecting what has happened in the packaging industry the last two years. Next one. Right. I mentioned about these uh, issues uh, that are facing the industry the last two years. But there have been a lot of issues which the packing industry has faced in the past, right now, and also in the future. So I now move into what happens after post COVID-19. Now, how long the pandemic will last? A lot of people are talking about vaccination. With, with this vaccination, what about consumer confidence? Will they return? Will traveling return? Are you confident enough to travel? So regardless of all these issues, we still have to face this very big issue called the climate change. Climate change is an issue facing the whole world, but more so is has a very big impact on the packing industry. I will go into a bit more discussions after this. So in uh, 2015, 197 countries adopted this Paris Agreement. Basically what it says, the countries should work together to limit the global average temperature rise in this century to well below two degrees Celsius, while pursuing efforts to limit the temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius. So 197 countries adopted this. From then on, a lot of initiatives have started, and now a lot of companies have set the targets. People like Shell, Petronas, BP, the target is to achieve net zero emissions by 2050. So 2021, barely 30 years from now, they want to achieve net zero emissions. So clearly the impact on the industry is going to be felt. In fact, one of the companies, Neste, has targeted even faster a rich carbon neutral production by 2035. And this company is number one in the world in uh, using bio uh, renewable resources and the waste oil resources. So it actually has a plant in Singapore, operating a waste oil to fuse plant in Singapore, 1 million tons a year, which is not small. You know, the cooking oil that you all use, the cooking oil that is uh, in uh, KFCs and McDonald's, all the oils and fats, they collect all this and it goes into the plant in Singapore to convert to diesel. So it's already started and they are going to expand the plant further. Next one. Right, arising from this Paris Agreement, a lot of initiatives have already been set in motion. Some are already commercialized. Some are being tested. Let's go down the list. The first one is the renewable energy. We are all very familiar with this solar, wind and wave which are now coming up other than hydro and geothermal. In the past, solar, the cost of producing power from solar and wind was actually quite high and could not compete with the power generated from gas or coal. But now the cost of producing the solar panels has come down. The cost of producing the wind turbines have all come down and the efficiency of converting the heat of I mean solar or wind to electricity has actually improved a lot. So the price of the cost of electricity produced from solar and wind has now come down and competing and can compete very strongly with that produced from natural gas or coal, even coal. So this is what is happening now. The latest tender in Malaysia, I think you know, the supply of uh, electricity from solar they attended, they came in about 20 cents 
per kilowatt hour, Malaysian trading cents. But in other countries, I'll give you one example, it's in China, in Mongolia, the electricity cost produced from wind is 1.5 US cents, which is uh, 6 cents, Malaysian cents, per kilowatt hour, as low as that. So it's coming in very, very strongly, renewable energy. And the target in a lot of countries is to push the production of uh, power from solar and wind renewable sources to as high as 40%, 30, 40%, and even higher. And Germany has achieved 21%. So it's coming on very, very strongly, renewable energy. Next one on the list, electrical vehicles. So again, many countries have set deadlines to stop using cars powered by internal combustion engines. Singapore is going to stop first the diesel driven cars, I think by 2025. And uh, UK has given a deadline for all these internal combustion engine power cars to be stopped, I think by 2035. So a lot of countries have set deadlines. And electrical vehicles are now very common on the road. Again, cost is high, but it will come down. I don't know how fast, but it will come down. Hydrogen fuel vehicles has just started uh, in many countries. They have put up hydrogen uh, refueling stations for these uh, vehicles to be driven. And again, the cost is very prohibitive, the cost of hydrogen. But again, they are all working on this to bring down the cost. Next one, green hydrogen as a source of fuel or feedstock. The technology is all there to produce green hydrogen using uh, electrolysis from water, but the cost is high right now. So we are waiting for the industry to come up with cheaper costs for the electrolysis. The next one is circular economy, which you are very familiar with. Recycle all your products, your plastics, recycle, use it back. Next one, renewable resources. Using biomass to convert to fuels, using biomass to convert to chemicals. You are very familiar with uh, what we call these uh, biodegradable plastics, the PLAs, the PHAs, polylactic acid, polyhydroxyl aconates. These are used to produce biode biodegradable products, the plates, the spoons, the cups. The technology is there, it's already in the market, but the cost is higher compared to the spoons and cups and all that plastic cups made from conventional plastics. So these are the initiatives which have uh, been set in motion. Next one. So what happens to our industry? With all these initiatives, some are really very advanced, some are just starting, but inevitably it will come in. So what is the impact on our industry? First, reduce demand for fuels. Very clearly, if you're driving EV cars, if you're producing electricity from solar and wind, consumption for gas comes down. All this will result in a reduced demand for fuels. The next one, by the time you have so many EV cars on the roads, wind turbines, all this require specialty chemicals for components. The solar panel has a lot of encapsulations which use EVA, the product which I mentioned just now. The wind turbines use a lot of composite materials for the wind blades. Electrical vehicles, the body parts have to be as light as possible. So there's a lot of uh, engineered plastics coming in here. Batteries, the components all require specialty chemicals. So you have a demand for specialty chemicals all going up to support all the initiatives which I mentioned earlier. So let's look at the next slide to see what is the impact. What about other things? You have uh, other environmental movements, the ban on single-use plastics, the use of biodegradable plastics, Increasing pressure on packing companies to manage waste. So I must share with you here, this is the slide, the point. There's a lot of pressure on us. How to manage waste? 
is now going to be mandatory. Waste management practices infrastructure, we have to spell out very clearly. We have to look at how to design products with the disposal in mind. It is not to dispose in the rubbish dump in the sea, but ultimate disposal so that it's a whole cycle, cradle to grave, we call this. From the plant cradle to the grave, we have to take care of that as a tech company. So these are things that are coming in, slowly but surely, affecting the tech industry, industry in how we actually are going to operate. So it will be more and more significant in the near future. So my question to you is, you are a consumer. Now look at yourself as a consumer. Are all these movements serious? I ask this because the cost of the biodegradable products, plastics, is 50% more. You buy a, uh, a bag which is made from PLA or PHA, it's going to cost you more than commercial plastics. As a consumer, are you going to use it? Right now, what we face is the demand is out there. Only a few, comp a few uh, well, I would say few, those uh, very, very uh, conscientious people will buy these sort of bags. But by and by, the general public will not buy this. So on the one hand, these initiatives are there. The society wants to move on, but the cost is prohibitive. So eventually, what will happen? Legislation may come in to say that, yes, for this place, we cannot use any conventional plastics. We must use biodegradable plastics. So certain countries, certain cities have started that, but it is not too many yet. So we shall see what is the rate of progress in imposing all these requirements, or what is the change in the consumer attitude. Will consumers pay more to buy all these products? This is going to impact on our industry. The, the speed at which the consumers adopt this will surely impact on the back end industry. Next one. Here I want to show you the photo of this uh, young girl, Greta Thunberg. She's Swedish. She's an environmental activist. She started early teens. No? She dropped out, not dropped, she skipped classes. She started this movement. Now she's only 18 years old. But as a young girl, her movement really inspired a lot of people. And I give you this uh, date here, September 2019. She inspired millions of protesters in more than 163 countries to march in climate strikes. She mobilized through social media. She's managed to convince so many people to come out and demonstrate and talk about climate changes. So her movement has actually caused a lot of immense pressure on governments and multinational com companies in the developed countries. You do not see much of her here in our part of the world, but in Europe, in US, the developed countries, she's very well known. She was uh, put on Time magazine as the, uh, what is this, the person of the year. And she has gone to United Nations She's gone to the World Economic Conference to give speeches. She's really recognized in this. And she singles out companies that are emitting large quantities of CO2. She will single out companies that are still mining for coal, that are still using coal. So through this pressure through the governments, what happens now is, here we talk about money talks, huh? How does she put all this pressure? It's through the public. A lot of public are shareholders of multinationals. They can use the boycott of these multinational, multinational products as a strong pressure, or they actually go to the AGMs, annual general meetings, as a shareholder to put pressure on those companies to achieve the targets which they set just now. I talked about Shell and BP setting all those targets for zero carbon emission. This is the pressure from the public reacting in that. She has uh, even, well, she's shamed the companies and she will even shame the USA presidents, Donald Trump 
and of course now Biden for not doing enough. So will this pressure build up? It will. So there is going to be an impact from all these initiatives which all the multinationals and the countries are taking for zero carbon emission that will impact on our industry. Okay, let's look at some other issues. Next one, please. Now, these issues are issues which we have uh, faced long time. It's not now, it's been a long term. And these are part and parcel of what as an industry we face. First one, I, we call it the uh, question about disadvantage of these stocks. As a packet industry, you want the cheapest cost of uh, this stock. The fee stocks for packet industry is either NAFTA from crude oil, coal, or gas. Gas in this case is ethane. So where do you get the lowest cost? Right now, low cost ethane comes from shale gas in USA. But NAFTA has a lot of volatility in the prices I mentioned just now. And coal, China uses a lot, but it emits a lot of CO2. So the industry is always faced this. You want cheap fish stocks? They are not around here, but the markets are around here. Our markets are Asia Pacific, but the costs of fish stocks, cheap fish stocks are all overseas, Middle East and USA. So this is the issue about disadvantage of fish stocks affecting the industry. The second one, the geopolitics affecting the crude oil and uh, NAFTA prices. OPEC and non-OPEC disagreements on production cuts affect crude oil prices and impact on NAFTA prices. If there happens to be a war in the Middle East, crude oil prices go up, NAFTA prices go up. So these are geopolitics issues which the industry faces but cannot control, of course totally outside the industry's control. Next one, which has been faced by the industry is trade barriers. Countries put up trade barriers to protect themselves. You saw the recent one four years ago when Donald Trump came in, in the USA, he imposed trade barriers. So this really affected the whole trading pattern and inevitably the production pattern for the packing industry. I'll give an example here how this trade barrier affected one very specific project. Just now I talk about low cost ethane from shale gas in USA. So the company in China had already done all the engineering construction, starting the construction to build an ethane cracker in China. The plan was to bring in low cost ethane from China, uh, from USA in uh, what we call very large ethane carriers, bring to China and crack the ethane to produce ethylene. And the production cost is very, very competitive using this. But when Donald Trump came in with all these uh, tariffs, the C2 cost, there was an impact 30%. So this affected the project. This is only one example of how trade barriers has affected this uh, tech industry. The one which, uh, the other one which uh, has been faced by our industry is the rapidly changing demand patterns. The consumers keep changing the taste, the one. Number two is because of all these initiatives that I mentioned just now, the products change, especially the chemicals requirement change. So there's always a change in the demand pattern. The industry has always to work around this to try to predict and try to adjust. And uh, price volatility is something which the industry has been facing and has to work around this. Prices go up, prices go down, and it's very volatile. The last one, which the industry has faced, I think you know that a lot of these specialty chemicals, um, they are controlled by patents. Those chemical companies, after the R&D, they have a product, they patent it, they last 20 years, after that, as patents expire, it becomes a commodity chemicals. So, example, we know this uh, 
super absorbents, super absorbent polymers, acrylates, which are used for diapers. You know, the Pampers, very famous brand. When last time, 20 years back, that was a really a specialty chemical. Very good margins for those products. But now it's already expired. Patents expired. Everybody's doing it. Chinese are doing it. So the high margins have now gone. It's very, very competitive. And those high cost companies like the BSF, Evonix, are selling off this business. So that is the scenario which we have in the packing industry. You have a specialty chemical, it will just last for a period of time. After that, it becomes a commodity. Then you have to work around it with your uh, cost effectiveness, etc. Uh, next one, please. So, what is the impact? I mentioned all about all those issues, all the uh, initiatives which have started. What is the impact on our industry in terms of demand for packets? Here, I must say that our lifestyle. We are very unlikely to change. In fact, I would say that our demand for new clothing, cars, phones will not change. Number one. Number two, as uh, poorer countries develop, those they become developing countries, the people there also want a higher standard of living. And we cannot deny them the requirement for higher standard of living. They will want the air conditioners, they want the fridge in the house, they want cars, they want phones, they want good clothing. All this is translated into demand for pet camps. So for the developing countries, the growth in the pet camp demand will continue to grow very steadily. But all the other initiatives, which I mentioned just now, will affect the demand for crude oil, number one. Number two is uh, as the Renewable resources contribute more and more to the feedstock supply. The demand for crude oil will also change. I also want to stress here, for our industry, it is very hard to find alternatives to packet products. There are many applications, you cannot find alternatives. And NAFTA, by far, is still the biggest source, biggest feedstock for petrochemical products. And NAFTA comes from crude oil. So the demand for crude for NAFTA will remain very steady. Next one. Now, there are a lot of scenarios which the multinationals have looked at. What happens if life as usual, we continue? What happens if we reach net zero carbon emission? What happens if there's a very strong movement for all this uh, I mentioned about circular economy, etc. What is the impact on the oil demand? This is a scenario which one of the multinationals have planned. They have economists, they got all the planners looking at this to look at all the various scenarios. If, of course, if there's life as usual, we keep on burning whatever we need. We keep on throwing whatever we, we buy and use, then you can see the demand goes up. The oil fish stock for plastics and fibers will continue to grow from 13, 12 million barrels a day, all the way to 17, 18 million barrels a day. But that is if life contains as usual. But if we are all so serious about environmental conservation, climate changes, renewable energy, then the demand for crude for feedstocks or plastics will come down to about 8 million barrels a day. But as I mentioned, it is still very, very significant. And you cannot replace oil with other products. Oil will be there. So this is a scenario. I just want to show to you that there will be an impact if all of us follow the initiatives and all the initiatives which they push, the governments push for that. Next one. So I mentioned about all the issues just now, both internal, um, I'll call it from the climate change as well as from the non-climate change issues. How is industry managing all these issues? The industry is a very resilient industry, the tech industry. 
We've been around for many years. We have managed all the changes and it is still doing very, very well. Basically, as I say, because consumers need our products. Okay, let's look at how we are managing these issues. Next one, please. First one, the imbalance in the crude oil refinery. I mentioned that there's only a requirement for more petrochemicals, but less demand for fuels. Your demand for gasoline, the demand for diesel come down. Demand for jet fuel comes down. But your demand for C2, C3 all goes up. So how do you manage that? So a lot of uh, small refineries are being shut down. Those are not efficient. Those are more producing this uh, crude into diesel topping refineries. Those are all shut down, being shut down. Instead, now the industry is moving towards integrated refinery, where within the same place, all are there. The refinery, the pecan, the crackers, they're all there. And the new term which the industry has uh, used is now crude to chemicals, C to C. From crude oil, you try to maximize the production of chemicals, not to maximize your production of gasoline, diesel, etc. But it's rather to maximize your cost, your production of chemicals. So let's see what the industry has done. Next slide, please. Now, this is the conventional refinery. I think you're very familiar with this. On the global average, 10% conversion of crude to chemicals per barrel. If you're looking at a well integrated refinery complex, 17 to 20% conversion of crude to chemicals per barrel. This is what is we are seeing right now. But what the industry has changed now is let's see the next slide. This refinery in China, Hengli, petrochemical refinery, they already built a plant, already operational. They achieved 42 conversion, 42 percent conversion of crude to chemicals. It's all integrated within one complex. Crude, of course, uh, here they do a bit of supplement, uh, supplement the production of hydrogen from coal gasification. But overall, you can see the conversion is 42%. That is already operational in China. Next one. But the industry is even more ambitious. It wants to go even more and more. So Aramco, Saudi Aramco, the approach to steam cracking crude oil, they want to go to as far as 70 to 80% conversion of crude to chemicals. Now, they have started the engineering work. They have entered into all the various technology development agreements. And they have also included all these uh, very innovative uh, designs, which is actually conversion of the C1 off gas into higher C2 products using the process called Saluria oxidative coupling of methane process. But that one is only a pilot plant and they are willing to test it here to convert this C1 into C2. Right. Now, what happened to this project during the COVID-19 slowdown? So this project is undergoing the design stage only. It's not gone into the construction stage. So the uh, Lumbus Global is the designer and they are working on the design. So it is not constructed yet. So we are all waiting to see this construction of this uh, project, which can help us achieve that 70 to 80% conversion. Next one. So what about other things? The world is pushing hard, circular economy, recycle products. The world is pushing hard for renewables. So what has the backup industry done? A lot of companies have put in a lot of money into R&D, into all these initiatives. To recycle products. We have a lot of these PET bottles which are thrown. We have a lot of plastics which are thrown into the sea. In fact, unfortunately, ends up in the sea. So companies like Eastman, they have got a demo, the uh, polymerization plant. This plant, is actually 250 million US dollar. It's not cheap, and they started the construction work. 100,000 tons a year, which is quite a good size, and they have started work, as I said. They convert the PET, uh, PET waste into dimethyl, terephthalate, and ethylene glycol. Actually, the technology existed 
30 years ago by Eastman. But the economics could not work. But now with the latest drive and the latest prices, they also get good prices because these plastics are considered as recycled plastics. They get a premium. So with this, the economy, the economy, economies work. And now they're constructing this one. Other products, other projects which is being uh, push ahead, BP, BP Infineon. This converts the PT to basic plastics. With the basic plastics is the purified terephthalate acid, PTA, and the MEG, mono ethylene glycol. Now this project is still a pilot plant. I might have to say they are waiting for the economics to be better before they go further. It's a pilot plant. Now BSF, Quanta, they have a pilot plant which is 16,000 tons per day per annum, which is not small, 16,000 tons per annum. They convert the waste plastics using pyrolysis to fuels. 16,000 tons per day is sizable. After that, they will scale it up. Next one is uh, Pure Cycle. They convert the polypropylene plastics back into the virgin plastics. So there you are. A lot of these initiatives have already been pushed by these uh, packing companies. This pure cycle, the plant which they have put up is 50,000 tons a day, also not small. Now in terms of the renewable space, I talk about green hydrogen to ammonia, the technology exists but the cost of the hydrogen is still high. So it is still prohibitive. What about biomass to fuse? Hydroparalysis of biomass to fuse. Again, the technology exists, but again, it's the cost. The last one is uh, Lancer Tech. I give an example, it's not the last one, but third on my list is a company called Lancer Tech. It converts uh, waste, carbon monoxide, and hydrogen to ethanol and to jet fuel. This product and product, uh, there's a price which the air companies are paying, air airlines are paying because it is a renewable product. So Lancer Tech is able to commercialize these plants. There are plants in uh, China, plants in India, converting the waste CO hydrogen to ethanol. So I'm giving you some examples of what the packing companies are doing in facing the challenges pushed by the society. So it's not idle. A lot of R&D efforts have been pushing to face these issues. Uh, next one. Those are R&D. What about our existing packing plants? Now, I mentioned it's very hard to now balance the uh, production because some products, then demand is high one moment, demand drops. So we need to really monitor the plant operations, control the plant operations. So a lot of digital technologies are now being implemented. The Internet of Things helps, is used to help the production. We call it supervisory control of the plant operations. Drones and robotics are being used. Drones, how do you use it to see what is happening in the plant? Robotics, if you want to do inspection of tanks, inspection of equipment, you send in a robot. These are things being done. If you need to ins ins uh, inspect the internal wall of these uh, tanks, you put in a drone for inspection. So all these are being used now to improve the way of operations, which will help to bring down the cost. So what about other things? Maintenance. Real-time monitoring of chemical assets is something which the industry is really pushing hard to enhance predictive maintenance accuracy cost-effective uh, safety monitoring, and also to improve the efficiency and the reliability of uh, logistics across the diverse supply chains. So all these require a lot of efforts by engineers to improve the operations in the facility. A lot of work is being put in. So that is operations, that is R&D. Next slide, please. Right. Now, just to conclude, I've given you an overview of the issues which the industry is facing. But as I mentioned, the demand for packing products is very steady. It's a question of how much it grows. 
and it depends on a lot of factors. In the developed countries, it is quite small. In the developing countries, Asia Pacific, Africa, it is very high because people are now having a higher standard of living. They require more and more packing products. So the growth is there. And the growth in the production of uh, crude, production of crude will continue to support this pack camp plus fuels. But it is only the imbalance which the industry is now trying to uh, change the imbalance by converting the plants to all these crude chemical plants. So all in all, there is a growth in the industry, but it's very challenging. So here we say that uh, there's a growth, but it's surrounded by uncertainty. A lot of things which the industry has to manage. Of course, it's challenging from the cost angle, from operation angle, but the industry has been very resilient for so many years and it's still profitable. So here I'd like to uh, end this uh, sharing of my experience on the various industries. Okay, thank you. Uh, Aya Chan for the very informative uh, sharing. So uh, now we we still have some time to take some questions. So uh, uh, dear students and staff, colleagues and public as well, uh, if you have any questions, uh, you may just uh, uh, post it out in the meeting chat. Okay. So Okay, we still. During the registration as well, uh, there's uh, some questions by this uh, uh, reg uh, registrant. So one of them uh, is, uh, so maybe Aya Chan can uh, just address this, uh, this, some of these Question. So maybe I just read it. Uh, this one question. Uh, uh, one of these is like, how did the fresh graduates of petrochemical engineering survive in COVID-19 pandemic? So this question may be a little bit off from the topic, but uh, maybe you can share some insight what happens in uh, dialogue, probably. So the question is, how did the fresh graduates of pet chem engineering survive during this uh, COVID-19 pandemic? Whether maybe is referring to the employment rate. Is is, is there any? Oh, I see. Uh, maybe I, I. Well, let me answer this way first. Huh? Now, yeah. Just now during the talk, you can see during the pandemic, they got all this uh, volatility, mm. prices, uh, products volatility, different you know, requirements. So a lot of companies were very prudent. All of us are very prudent. When something happens like this, the first thing we do is let's look at the cost. So where necessary, we take in staff. That's what the industry does. But there is a necessity to take in staff. We have to maintain the facilities. We've got to keep on operating. So where required, the staff are taken in. That's one. Eh? But of course, due to all this uncertainty, of course, you know that uh, a lot of companies' bonuses were affected. Uh, increments were affected in the industry. In general, huh? but of course, there are certain growth industries. I mentioned about Top Love, uh, you know, Hata Lega and all that. They are all taking people like crazy, you know. Yeah. <laughs> they are recruiting like crazy. In booming, fact, yeah. They are booming. Now, what has happened is even Top Love is going upwards integration. They used to buy the nitro rubber from Taiwan, uh, Korea, Japan. Now they're going to produce themselves. So they have already started the construction in Banting, a facility. Eventually, it's going to produce up to three to 400,000 tons of NBR, natural mm. rubber, for mm. their own rubber gloves. So, these plants, they're big, you know, in planting, and they are recruiting a lot of engineers. Construction has started. I know they took a lot of engineers for the engineering work. This was uh, one year back, one year back. Eh? The construction physically has started. So, there are a lot of other companies also now investing in. Sintoma in uh, Pasukuda is the spending, the uh, natural rubber plant. A lot of companies are coming in to mm. do that. Petronas, 
has also started a natural rubber time in Pomerang. Yeah. So I'm saying that while we have all these challenges, the companies continue to look at investment opportunities. Mm. And natural rubber is something which is very, very sellable. They are all coming in. Not only this, this, there are a lot more companies coming in. Mm. So there's a, there's a growth. Not in the traditional big crackers, you know, the refinery crackers, but in the specialty chemicals. That is a space which the backup industries are now coming in. So there is a demand. So it's a question of certain sectors. Mm. Other sectors are very prudent, so you only get a chance if there's a replacement or a couple of, couple of vacancies available. But those companies like Top Love, they're taking a lot of people. And of okay. course, the other factors, the other areas, the the, uh, the mask, making masks, face masks, that one is also a lot of, uh, <laughs> a lot of investments coming in. So mm. all in all is balanced, I'll put it this way. So mm. as a fresh graduate, there are opportunities available. Let's go and grab it. Don't be choosy. If it's the bunting, they go for it. And uh, they are putting rubber glove factories all over the place. Hatalega is putting up in uh, Kulin near the border. So you don't mind staying near the Thai border, please. A lot of opportunities are there. I see, I see. Okay. So, so, so that will translate to uh, a lot of opportunity for employment, yeah, for the fresh graduate especially. Yeah. So the, there's also a plan coming up now in Kate. Uh This is the alkalates. Alco this is actually mm -hmm. the detergent coming up. Already approved, it started construction. So there are small little plants all coming up everywhere. I'm talking about Malaysia. Mm -hmm. All over the world, wise, it's the same. And there are a lot of plants which are coming up to recycle all these products. I mentioned about all those projects. We are, right now, even we, we I know that the economics will not work, but we're also looking at it. How to recycle those products? So we are finding a product which, at the end, the economics work for us. So a lot of work is going on into this. Not just by us, everyone. The Petronas, the Shell, the ESO, the, just now I mentioned about Singapore, Nestle, all doing this. Mm. That's a totally new industry coming up to support all the initiatives. Are you aware that uh, your cooking oil is all collected? Use cooking oil. The one in the KFCs and McDonald's. They are collected. It ends mm. up in Singapore to be produced back into diesel. Yeah. Okay, so any other questions? Uh, any other, the meeting chat is still no, but there are an, another two questions. Yeah. Uh, so there's a fresh graduate question. I think, is it a bad time to enter the oil and gas industry as a fresh graduate? Uh, the, the, the question is that I have completed my internship at oil and gas company. I'm wondering if it's viable to enter the industry back upon graduation. Maybe that will relate back to what you have shared earlier. That, uh, there are so many developments, right, I think? So yes. many opportunities. Now, if the question is just to focus on oil and gas, mm. I've given just now the talk, mm. the demand for oil is still there, oil and gas. It mm. will remain. It's a question of it may come down mm. to a level where things get balanced up. It will be used to support the packing industry. Some of the group goes into supporting the fuels industry. And then the balance is supported by the renewable energy. Mm. We will come to a balance, but I think we have to recognize that we cannot get rid of oil. It is a necessity. And this oil and gas industry is, uh, I think you know the peculiarity. Mm. You start producing, you, start, you find a reservoir where there's oil and gas, you start producing, just like any storage uh, vessel, eventually it empties out. So that reservoir, reservoir will run dry. So the industry keeps on drilling, keeps on looking for more and more areas to drill. It has to do that to sustain. Right now, the demand for crude oil is almost 100 million barrels a day. Mm -hmm. 90 plus, just as I mentioned. Mm -hmm. It may come down to 80 million eventually, based on the forecast. You still need to continue producing the oil and gas. And to do that, you need to continually look for new reservoirs drill and produce. The moment you stop all this, your production comes down, eventually the world cannot support the, even the 80 million barrels a day mm -hmm. of oil. And then what happens is, oil price will fill up. Yeah. 
is 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 the question of this uh, balance and supply, supply and demand. Mm -hmm. So the demand for oil will still remain. But right now we have seen that those hundred dollars oil, hundred dollars barrel per, per barrel of oil, those days are gone now. So now it's about 60, 70, 60 which is something, yeah. Mm. Yeah. When the oil price was hundred dollars a day, all those working in the oil and gas industry were living like a, <laughs> living a lot. There's <laughs> a lot of money to spend. Yeah. Now yeah, they are definitely. more prudent. Yeah. Okay. They are more prudent, but it is still required. Okay. So if there's a job in the oil and gas industry offered to this gentleman, mm -hmm. by all means, please go in. Okay, I think the, there's another last question is about uh, how and what is the progress of petrochemical purification process? So not sure I whether... Think I've already covered that just now. Mm -hmm. The re re uh, recovery of uh, PET bottles, the recovery mm -hmm. of uh, polypropylene mm -hmm. plastics. Yep. Recycle back the PET into the virgin plastics. Polypropylene recycle back into the original plastics, mm -hmm. original uh, pet can products. Mm -hmm. These technologies are already available. Some are pilot plants, some are actually commercialized, as I gave the example. The, this uh, Eastman. Eastman one is already commercialized. Mm -hmm. So all these are confirmed, technology proven, is only economics. I, I gave the example just now mm -hmm. I think I, during the talk. Eh? Yeah, yeah. So all these are very real. Mm. So definitely waste there will be diesel is also mm. proven. I told you waste oil to diesel proven. Mm. Uh, biomass to uh, PLA, PHA, all proven. Mm -hmm. Your polyplast, polylactic acid, polyhydroxy aconates, all these are proven. Mm. To biodegradable plastics. Yes, yep. all proven, except yep. the price is high. Yep. That's the challenge. Uh, definitely. Uh, that's the challenge for challenge the young today. engineers. That's the challenge to all the engineers out there. Mm. How do you bring down the cost of all this? That's yep. a challenge. So I was saying about the solar and the wind energy. They mm -hmm. reacted to the challenge. They took up the challenge. Now the cost is unbelievable. It's so mm -hmm. low. Yeah. The only issue with those is not stable. When the wind blows, there is no wind, no energy. Mm -hmm. The sun, nighttime, there's no production. Mm -hmm. So the next challenge to them is storage. That's the next challenge. Yep. How to produce daytime, store it. When the wind blows, you store it. Mm -hmm. So the investments into batteries, I tell you, it's immense. Mm. Storage. Very, very yeah. important is how to find the storage. Yeah, that, that's also applied to the electric vehicles, right? The, the yes, correct. Batteries, so, the batteries. central. Yeah. Yes. But the batteries, again, they are all improving, you know. Mm -hmm. Very, very efficient now, getting smaller and smaller. Mm -hmm. The lithium ion batteries. More so, rather than nickel. Mm. So that's another area. Yeah. Engineers can work on it. Our engineers, petrochemical engineers, all can mm. work on it. Yeah. So it looks like there's a lot of uh, <coughs> exciting times ahead. For it's, our, it's a spin off into yeah. all these other areas. We mm. should not think about traditional crackers. Uh. Mm. I want to get involved work in a refinery and packing uh, the cracker. That is traditional. Yeah. But now we have specialty products. We should all focus on that. Not the traditional ONG anymore. Now we more yes, to the yes. specialty chemicals. Yeah. Specialty all right. Chemicals. Okay. So uh, I think the time is almost up. Uh, again, on behalf of the University of Tungkal Brahma, of course, I'd like to thank again Aya Chan for taking your time for these uh, sharing sessions. Yeah. So I don't think there's any more question in the meeting chat. Uh, again, uh, Miss Lee, over to you. Is there anything that uh, you want to take over, right? Uh, yeah, I will take okay. over. Okay. Okay, so I think no more questions um, yeah. from the participants. Okay, so if you have anything want to ask um, Aya Chan or Dr. Tan, you may email to us, then I will pass the question to them if you yeah, sure. uh, have anything. Okay, um, thank you Aya Chan for this um, great sharing today. And then also thank you Dr. Tan. Okay, so okay. Um, okay. Um, Okay, I guess there's nothing from our participants now. Okay, so um, before we end the webinar, I have a request. Um, I just posted the sign out form link and also the feedback form link. I would appreciate if you can help us to fill up the feedback form. Okay, so um, that's all for today. That's all, huh? Okay. okay.
Thank you. Chan. Thank you again, Ayah Chan. See you again. You. All right, bye-bye. Bye. For all participants, thank you again. Thank you, Miss Lee. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay, we will end the session now.